Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Thinking Things Through, Critical Thinking for Critical Times. I'm your host, Michael Sukal. We are pleased to have with us today Pete Shimazaki, Doctor. Pete is a member of the Hawaii Okinawa Alliance, or HOA, the Veterans for Peace Hawaii, and a board member of Hawaii Peace and Justice, or HPJ, which is a local grassroots hui nurturing peace through social and ecological justice. Today, we're going to be discussing war, peace, and demilitarization, finding a way forward in a time of danger. Welcome to the show, Pete. Aloha, Michael. Mahalo for uh, hosting this forum. And, um, sure. Mahalo for those who came before us in this Kanako EV land that we could have this conversation. Thank you so much. So I want to start out by um, talking about your, your background uh, and what led you from being in the military to being a peace advocate and a proponent of demilitarization. Uh, can you start us off? Sure. That's a great place to start with our, my ancestors. Um, I am the product of war on my uh, father paternal side, uh, mm -hmm. Ashkenazi Jews, that um, my uh, father was a Marine, 27 years Marine Corps, it included World War II, Battle of Okinawa, Korea, and Vietnam. Right. Um, and goes back further, my uh, great grandfather um, was uh, him and his business person uh, burned up in, by the Nazis in the Holocaust. On my mother's side, uh, Okinawa, Uchinanchu, Shimanchu, from the Ryukyu Islands. And um, so uh, have a little PTSD on both sides of the family. Um, that um, has really informed me um, uh, coming from a bicultural, biracial perspective. Yes. Okay, well, um, let's get uh, drilled down a little bit. Um, how would you say your family background influenced you to think and feel about war? Well, I having a ex Marine father, um, I was always um, explained that um, it's unfortunate son, but war is a part of life. It's part of human nature, it cannot be changed. And thus it is, and I was uh, ingrained with that coming up. And so when I was in high school, I, was um, enticed for many different reasons to enlist in the military, including uh, coercion and lying by military recruiters quite abusively. Uh -huh. um, but it was also other factors, including uh, wanting to be of service, uh, being part of a family tradition, um, as well as uh, getting education in a, you know, uh, a career um, as well. And of course, uh, financing uh, education Yes, yes. So uh, how was it that you uh, went from being, uh, you ended up being a, a combat medic, right? Correct. And then, uh, I don't know the timing on this exactly, and it may not be that important, but at a certain point, you were discharged honorably. And, but then after a while, I don't know how long the period was, because of the, uh, just before the be beginning of the what we now call maybe the first Iraq war, which was called the Gulf War or Project, uh, what was it, Desert Storm? Desert Storm. Yeah, you were subject to reactivation into the military. So how did you go from, and what happened between the time you were subject to reactivation and you ended up becoming a community organizer and peace advocate? Well, I was using my GI Bill um, mm -hmm. back to school and to clarify, yes, I, uh, my title was combat medic. Um, fortunately, I was able to um, not be sent to combat just because of the timing of my enlistment. That's all. It was uh, towards the end of the Cold War. But um, as you mentioned, um, I, upon my honorable discharge, I did my uh, terms of my uh, first and only uh, contract service. Um, Desert Storm started brewing, and they were mentioning um, about the real possibility, and they started um, reactivating um, inactive reservists like myself. So I um, thought to myself, well, I signed up for this as my kuleana or my responsibility. So while I'm going to school, I want to know more about this war that I might be possibly sent to. And so uh -huh. I just started my, my basic you know, studies, my first 
poli sci first history class in college and uh -huh. I was very intensely uh, researching and I'm um, very quickly uh -huh. not happy with what I learned about um, yeah. U.S. foreign policy that was left out of um, say high school. Uh huh. So you you pretty much came to this information and knowledge and realization on your own, or were you influenced by teachers or people on the outside of uh, the university, or what? At this point, it was largely self-driven interest. You know, I was mm -hmm. re researching, um, yeah. but it was also um, community resources like community radio. Mm -hmm. um, and where was this, by the way? Well, this was in Southern California. I see. Um, and so there is a yeah, community radio mm -hmm. program, public media, for example, where I was just, yes. you know, um, trolling, um, so to speak, uh, information. And, and um, from that, it just uh, was nonstop at all. So like my writings and research were about the things I was really interested in learning. About. Right. So you, because of your background and what happened to you uh, over the course of your life, that's what why you ended up having kind of an intense focus on these issues? Absolutely. Okay. As well as the experiences along the way. Yeah. Because uh, right. at that, you know, um, I had these experiences that real things really crystallize all the information mm -hmm. um, where I was poised to go. And uh, I'll share one of them was in a yeah. uh, first poli sci class uh -huh. um, where the teacher had uh, set up kind of a class debate forum. Mm -hmm. And the debate was, um, supporting or against um you know the start of the desert storm war because at that point it hadn't started yet right well, this no. would have been early late 1990 early 1991 it recall. was early 90s it was like 90 91 to be exact yeah um, absolutely i guess that wasn't exact it was one of those years um but the point here is that um granted most of the students in that class were pretty apathetic they was more interested in partying or going to their jobs. Yeah. Um, I was uh, poised against an uh, older student um, mm -hmm. who was for the pro-war side. And mm -hmm. um, we were, you know, exchanging as debate goes. And I was, um, you know, rallying fact after fact um, about, you know, why I was opposed to it. Mm -hmm. um, I won't get into for keep this. Yeah, brief. right. Um, and then um, he really didn't have really many factual based arguments. It was just opinions. Why right, right. You go to war? And he said, well, I'm not about to pay $5 for a gallon of gas. And that uh -huh. point, I just, it blew my mind. I was a uh -huh. stood up so fast. I knocked the chair down uh -huh. and I'm like, you want me to go fight a war so you can have cheap gas? And then, <laughs> you know, quickly the professor said okay okay class let's uh you know <laughs> top of debate you know uh, <laughs> yeah get pretty excitable but right. I, you know, in that same class i should mention another factor that really um informed me and that was um one of my classmates was actually a bosnian refugee oh. and um she was it was painful hearing her daily um ordeals of not knowing what was going on with her family back in bosnia. And if we could just mention just briefly what was that all about with bosnia what was going on that led that was to the Yugoslavian civil war? Okay, and, and uh, um, yeah, you know the Serb the Serb ethnic cleansing, right? Um, and that was later in the 1990s, I believe. That was early 90s. Um, early, okay. Uh, the Balkan right. conflict. Um, it it didn't end there, so I yeah. think that's why you're right. referring to later years. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this was the beginnings of it, and yeah. um. It just really impressed upon me that here we had a humanitarian crisis. Um, the girl was tearful that she didn't know what was going on in her family. And I felt as a military veteran, like, hey, if there's a, ever a need for the military, this is when we should go in. You know, I was ready yeah. to, you know, fire it up to, for that. But then the, what was happening instead was this huge push and cheerleading by the media to rush into war. Um, yeah. over Kuwait and Iraq, um, right, right. It, you know, was uh, you know wasn't a democracy. Was you know a monarchy with gold seat toilets, and you know, and it just came clear to me. I was like, wow, if your export is pineapples or something, you're irrelevant. But if your export is oil, 
you know, suddenly your top priority. And so right, quickly right. I personally felt the hypocrisy mm -hmm. um, of warmongers yeah. and how um, folks within the military were being used for these political yeah. economic agendas. Yeah. Now, uh, I want to skip ahead because our time is, you know, kind of going by. We'll get back to some of this. Um, could you just briefly say a little bit about, and I mean briefly here, uh, what it was about your uh, experiences in Okinawa and then your move to Honolulu, go to grad school and, you know, your time as a high school social sciences teacher at Farrington. How did all this kind of contribute to changing your thinking or your consciousness about the work you ended up doing? Absolutely. So as I mentioned, you know, um, learning what I had been denied to know, um, I also moved to Okinawa and deeply um, got into my maternal culture and yes. understanding. And so it was, a, it was an experience of, you know, having been, so to speak, within the military base fences, you know, the barbed wire fences as a soldier, but yeah. also as a civilian in the outside community mm -hmm. living on the other side. And so mm -hmm. it was seeing both sides particularly uh -huh. the civilian side and all the suffering uh, the Okinawan people were being put through through this uh, uh, imposed militarization of their lands. And this yeah. was having to do with the aftermath of World War II? Well, you, that's how it started. Right. But World War II ended like, what's, how many, 75? 1945, yeah. So um, as you know, Okinawa was also used continue to be used through the Korean conflict, you know, in Vietnam. So it, it was perpetual uh, for by the United, the, by the United States. Well, yes, by the United States military. However, equally um, guilty to this situation was the Japanese government who mm -hmm. um, to this day maintains um, not just the, the alliance with the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's the nation of Japan that also um, invites or welcomes the U.S. military there. Um, but it's also the case that the Japanese government imposes most of those military bases and concentrates them into tiny Okinawa because most of the Japanese yeah. have military bases in their backyards. And the reason for this continued discrimination of pushing in on Okinawa lands is one, uh, you know, colonization. Uh, the UK was colonized by Okinawa and those dynamics continue to day. It, it's you know, like Hawaii was still um, treated unequally as a uh, colonial possession. Right. And, and just, to, just to point out, Okinawa, like Oahu, is also an island, although it's a much bigger island. It's, 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 it's close to the, uh, the mainland of Japan, but it's, it is surrounded by water, correct or not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, okay. it's central to, they say, the gateway to, to Asia, but also right. in the closing is... Um, Japan's denial of uh, Uchinanchu as an indigenous people in our, you know, in our wow. history as an independent nation kingdom. And Okinawa. So, Okinawa is a Japanese name. It was formerly Luchu or the Yukyu kingdom. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so I want to just, again, for the interest of time, we can weave some of this other stuff about your experience in, but I, you know, and, and you know, again, the theme of how you went from being a military combat medic to the work you're doing now. We'll mention some of the other work that you've been done or been doing. Now I wanna focus to the issues uh, of security. Uh, now this came up in our discussion prior to coming on the air. Um, what, is, what does security mean to you? What is it? And once we know what it is, how do we achieve it? Well, let's start with how it's commonly defined as national security. Yes. Well, national as a nationalism, it, it's interest of the state. Um, so it's inherently politically defined. You mm -hmm. know, it's a posture of power versus genuine human security, which uh -huh. is different. Mm -hmm. That's where the needs of the people are priority and not the state. Um, yes. So genuine human, uh, human concerty is like, safe, clean drinking water, you know, uh, jobs that aren't, you know, poised to oppress us, um, not having to go to the front line just because you want a college education. You know, these are um, other issues of militarism. And but I would add, I don't know what you think, being secure from 
the threat of the planet being destroyed, either accidentally or on purpose. Absolutely. You know, the, the U.S. military is one of the biggest uh, contaminator polluters of the planet, uh, not exclusively. And so it's ironic and hypocritical to say it's securing us, just like the Red Hill fuel leak situation. Yes. Is yeah. they're, they're insisting this false narrative that it's for an interest and protection when in fact it's um, threatening not just our lives, but also our, uh, our economy uh -huh. and on so many levels that uh, water is our security. And, yes. Wow. And I would, I would throw in, we may not have time to discuss this in detail, but the conflict in Ukraine between Russia and Ukraine with the significant support, military and other kinds of support from the United States and the NATO countries, which is, seems to be putting us much closer, or the closest we've come to a nuclear war since 1962 in the Cuban Missile Crisis, where there was a standoff between the US and what was then the Soviet Union around uh, Soviet missiles being on the island of Cuba. But let's not go there now, unless you have something to say about that. Um, yeah, well, briefly, because it is important and relevant, Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting how quickly there's billions to send for arms yes. to Ukraine, um, yet there's never enough money for education, healthcare, mm -hmm. housing, you know, these basic, again, human needs. And I think what's important to underscore here, Michael, is that yes. um, it's estimated by the UN, uh, the billions needed to uh, alleviate world hunger yes. um, would be just 3% of the U.S. military budget. Yes. You know, and so... If you think about it, a lot of uh, this uh, global suffering, as they say, a hungry man is an angry man, right. um, could create more stability through the world, uh -huh. uh, economically and otherwise. Right. Um, but we have this system where uh, the militarism, where um, the military, not just in the United States either, uh -huh. um, takes so much of our resources away from our people. You know, we provide yes. not the blood, but the sweat and the labor to provide those taxes. And yes. yet it's just taken away from us and used in ways that we've never approved of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and just to, to touch again on your personal experience, what, what you, I believe you called your bi-evolution on the issue of security. Uh, maybe you wanna say what, what you meant by that, but basically how do you see that we could move from a, a national state local security paradigm based on war, conflict and militarization to one based on demilitarization, de-escalating conflict, all the other factors that would be alternatives. And how did your real life experience with these issues change your consciousness about them over time? Big question in short. Yeah. You know, so starting with that question or that, that premise yeah. um, that war is a part of life, you can't help it. Right. Um, I took that as my central thesis in, in college. And uh -huh. I did an intense multidisciplinary study across different sciences. And I guess the question is it, in fact, you know, war is a part, inevitable part of human nature. Yes. And the result I got from the social sciences and, and, and even uh, biological sciences is, is no, it's not. Mm -hmm. There's too many exceptions. Um, that is not a universal paradigm. And yes. so, uh -huh. um, again, as I mentioned, the enormous uh, resources that are poured into uh, the mil militarism is could be channeled to human needs, which would provide more security from there. Yeah, would, you know, you know, like um, how are we achieving peace through uh, arming Ukraine and then bombing each other? It just keep, you know, it's escalating, and like other wars, it could just spread out of control. Absolutely. Versus, like the example of uh, let's say Latvia, not to mention civil rights movement or uh, in Gandhi's India, India where uh, nonviolent civ civil disobedience actually yes. achieved goals uh, that militarism uh, can't. Because if war solved our problems, we wouldn't have any more wars, would we? Right, yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, just to mention in this context, um, uh, there have been reports recently uh, that uh, the US government through the Department of Homeland Security is actually providing millions of dollars to produce anti-radiation medication. And 
it's very interesting that this is happening at a time when the rhetoric between the United States and Russia is escalating around the issue of nuclear war. I don't know if you have a comment on that. I have two quick ones. One, it enrages me that uh, there's already blood contamination going on. Uh, in Okinawa, um, they found levels of PFAS in the bloodstream higher than those to their Japanese co counterparts, you know, as an uh, illustration of what happened to military families here in Hawaii and Oahu recently when the Navy poisoned their water, right? So that's already an issue from military bases, you know, for Camp Lejeune. I see. Yeah. And two, um, it, it's a statement of how the U.S. is ready to sacrifice people, you know, instead of preventing this from happening, they're preparing for it's happening instead right you know as uh einstein was i said you can't simultaneously prevent and prepare for war and mm -hmm. and they've demonstrated that um they're willing to sacrifice our resources and people for this political economic agenda and were you referring to ICANN, the uh, international organization that is working to eliminate nuclear weapons i didn't quite get what no. you said no i didn't necessarily imply that because for me okay. I know nuclear war is a concern, but to me, conventional warfare is just as much a concern. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Think about World War I and how the devastation, not to mention in the 90s, we had a genocide through machetes, right? So I, to me, war is the problem, whether it's nuclear or otherwise. I see, I see. And, uh, you know, just to, we're going to have to wrap up, but uh, I want to ask you uh, kind of a quick two-part question. So how are all these issues we've been discussing in terms of your background and what's important to you relevant to what's going on in the world today? That's the first part. And then what's the role of education? You've been a teacher. What's the role of education in bringing about the kinds of citizens that are able to understand and critically evaluate these kinds of issues? In the interest of time, I'm gonna address your second question, Mark. Okay, I, sure. You know, education, of course, is critical. You, you don't know if you don't know, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I would add that it's more than education. Education is not enough. It also requires caring, okay? And I'd also expand ed education, not as something that's limited to the classroom, but education more as wisdom and a greater mm -hmm. understanding that could right. be learned not just in the classroom, but from like working with the land, you know, and uh -huh. other forms of uh, interaction with other people and the planet, which can inform us to greater truths um, right. And then, but again, without action, without caring, it's pretty much meaningless, you know? So you, you need both. And, um, you know, for your for, first question, I, I don't know if I heard it correctly, but for me, that's where I'm at is the, um, you know, how do you take knowledge information and more right. importantly, what do you do with it? You know, well, you just put it on a shelf with all these, you know, degrees and a wall or right. put into practice, uh, not talking about it, but doing something about it. Right, right. And you might mention, we might mention in closing, your work with uh, Oahu water protectors, as well as with the, the Red Hill situation. And um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. But I want to thank you so much, Pete. We've been speaking with Pete Shimazaki, doctor, a board member of Hawaii Peace and Justice. You can reach APJ on their website and hopefully our engineer will show that website right now. It's uh, the, the address is hawaiipeaceandjustice.org. And you can learn much more about HPJ and their work on HPJ's Facebook page. And also uh, we want to show uh, the Okinawan HOA organization. Oh, wow. That's oh, actually wow. But it's it's one of the some of the community organization efforts I am. Um, involved with in terms of uh, diaspora, Chinanchu, right? Something to protect our motherland. And what does uh, uh, HOA stand for? Hawaii Okinawa Alliance. Or just Hawaii. Okay. Hawaii means friend or ally in Hawaii. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to show that on the screen too. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Pete. We'd love to have you back sometime. Mahalo. Okay. Mahalo. Aloha. 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 This has been Thinking Things Through, Critical Thinking for Critical Times on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Michael Sukoff. Please do join us again two weeks from today. And uh, if the engineer would please put my email address on the screen, I would love feedback about the show, any suggestions, criticisms. And again, please do join us again two weeks from today at this same time, wherever you may be. Mahalo.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.